Way back when the Fire Emblem series was brand new and many of its established traditions were not yet set in stone, Fire Emblem Gaiden, the game that would go on to become the black sheep of the franchise, was created. For the many years following its release, as the series pivoted back into the style of the first game, many of Gaiden's most unique ideas had become entirely buried and forgotten. That was, at least, until now. Fire Emblem 8 The Sacred Stones is a lot of things. Often called the spiritual sequel to Gaiden, at the same time it's also the final Game Boy Advance entry and a continuation of the Binding and Blazing Blades style. On top of this, it was also the second game in the entire franchise to be released in the West, and it also had to balance both progressing the series for veterans as well as appeasing the many new fans they had gained. Needless to say, The Sacred Stones had some very big shoes to fill, and the ways in which it did so have gone on to not only make it one of the most divisive games in the franchise, but also, through its release, establish a new format for Fire Emblem games to take on. A major change that in some ways would be the genesis of the divide between new and old players that we still see today. For myself, being one of the few who A. actually played Gaiden multiple times, and B. really enjoyed it, the concept of bringing back some of its mechanics into the more fine-tuned gameplay of the GBA era was incredible news for me. For, as half-baked as many of its ideas were, Gaiden was a game that had a lot of potential, so much so that I have remained charmed by it even after covering the next five games that came afterwards. Having now played through the Sacred Stones twice, experiencing each route of the story and getting familiar with its significant post-game content, I ended up finding both more and less than what I expected. In this video, we're going to attempt to find out exactly what that is, by of course examining Fire Emblem 8 in detail. I'll be taking a look at its development history, giving a synopsis of the story, and then analyzing the plot along with the many gameplay developments that started here, all in order to best present what I've found. It's been a long time getting to this, the halfway point in the entire series. So let's not waste any more time and get this thing started. The story of the development of the Sacred Stones is actually one that begins with the next game, Path of Radiance. That sounds very strange to say, but it's actually true. Following the international success of 2003's Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade, for the next game in this franchise, Intelligent Systems made the decision to transition from a handheld system back to a console, aiming for the Nintendo GameCube for what would become the first 3D Fire Emblem. With this new goal in sight, the staff believed that they would not be returning to the the Game Boy Advance. But perhaps after realizing the amount of work that would be required to transition from 2D to 3D for the first time, Intelligent Systems decided on creating a second Fire Emblem game at the same time that Path of Radiance was being developed. This is the game that would go on to become The Sacred Stones. For this second team, Sachiko Wada was selected as the game's director, working alongside Taiki Ubukata and Kentaro Nishimura. Wada herself had worked on the character designs of the previous game, and here, alongside Ryo Hirota, she continued that role in addition to directing. For the first time ever in the series, the musical compositions were not handled directly by Yuka Tsujiyoko. She instead served as the sound supervisor for the newer composers Yoshihiko Kitamura, Saki Haruyama, and Yoshito Hirano. Even though the game's development started after Path of Radiance, and was even announced afterwards as well, creating yet another Fire Emblem in the by now pretty well-worn style of the Game Boy Advance titles allowed for a very breezy development. It was not long until October 7th, 2004, when it was released in Japan, only about a year and a half after the previous game. After the many translation problems of the Blazing Blade, much more care was put into localization this time, a process that was also easier due to this game's simpler and shorter script. On May 23rd, 2005, the second Western Fire Emblem game came to North America, with its European release following in November of the same year. Like with the seventh game, The Sacred Stones was met with praise from all regions, with reviewers enjoying the story, characters, and setting, while having more mixed opinions regarding its similarities to the last game. Western reviewers' lack of familiarity with the history of the franchise had led to exactly what I would have expected to be said about Fire Emblem 7 in comparison with the 6th, but thankfully this did not seem to take away from most players' enjoyment. Next up here, I'm going to be giving a full story synopsis, followed by my own general analysis in the subsequent chapter. If you'd like to go ahead and jump right to the analysis section, you can use the timecode seen at the top of the screen. On the other hand, if you're looking to avoid all story spoilers, you can jump to the time 
time code at the bottom of the screen to get to the gameplay sections, which will be spoiler free. Now is your last chance because we're starting in three, two, one. Long ago, in the distant land of Magvil, humanity found itself under assault by a massive monster army, led by the mighty demon king Formotus. With no help against the enemy horde, humanity appealed to the gods themselves and was gifted five holy objects, which came to be known as the Sacred Stones. With these stones in hand, humanity finally stood a chance against the forces of darkness, and after much blood and sacrifice, the demon king was sealed away. With this, a well-earned peace, one that would last for over 800 years settled across the land. Five nations developed on the continent, Fralia, Rostin, Jahana, Grotto, and Rene. Each one of these housing one of the sacred stones, with a sixth mercantile nation named Carcino coming a bit later. In recent years, the nations of Rene and Grotto had shared particularly good relations, but all of this was shattered one day when the southern nation suddenly attacked and invaded its loyal neighbor. As Grotto's armies crashed through Rene, claiming territory after territory with ease, within the capital, the king ordered his daughter, Princess Erica, to flee while accompanied by the loyal knight Seth in order to to seek assistance from their northern ally Fralia. As the princess was spirited away just as Grotto troops moved in, the duo evaded capture until reaching safety in Fralia. Here they met with its king, Hayden, who revealed, sadly, that the Grotto forces, upon reaching the Rene throne room, had brutally murdered the king. With her father gone, Erica's only remaining family was her brother Ephraim, a brave and powerful youth who was currently mounting a guerrilla resistance to the Grotto Empire, trying to stop their advance. While the Fralians offered Erica their protection, the princess instead insisted on marching back out in an attempt to reunite with her brother. Taking along some of Fralia's finest warriors, she did exactly that. Along the way, she was shocked to find that monstrous beasts had begun to roam the land freely again, and on the way to her brother, she was required to fight through some of these reawakened monstrosities. As Erica was continuing her journey, Ephraim's resistance back in the south had finally moved in on its target, arriving at the strategically important Fort Rinval in Grotto. With most of the Grotto troops out looking for himself and his sister, the prince believed that the fort would be underdefended. But after he and his loyal soldiers launched their assault, it turned out to all be a trap. The knight Orson, who had been accompanying the prince, betrayed his liege and made a deal with Grotto. And now Ephraim and his remaining knights were forced to flee under heavy pursuit. By the time that Erika's group had fought their way to the fort, there was no sign of Ephraim or his soldiers, only a disturbed looking Orson inviting them in. It was the highly trained Seth who realized that something was amiss, and with Orson outed as a traitor, Grotto sprung its second trap, now with the princess in its sights. As Erica struggled against the new waves of forces, her brother surprisingly reappeared, having somehow evaded capture this entire time. Reunited at last, the twins combined their might and ousted the commander of the Grotto forces. Although they were safe for now, they agreed that they needed to retreat from their homeland before their foes could return, and soon the two fled again to the kingdom of Fralia. While while on the road, Erica and Ephraim questioned why this terrible war had suddenly been thrust upon them. Before Grotto's sudden aggression, both of them had been best friends with Grotto's Prince Leon, a frail but intelligent young man who had always detested violence. When they were finally back in Fralia, Ephraim revealed Murr, a young girl he had been protecting, who was in actuality a dragon in human form called a Manakeet, and was also the adoptive daughter to the Great Dragon, one of the figures who had played a major part in defeating the Demon King long ago. Murr could only cryptically say that she felt a miasmic wave of evil emanating from the Grotto Empire, and that clearly something otherworldly was happening there. This wave of evil was likely what had awakened the monsters that were already running rampant across the continent yet again. Elsewhere in Fralia, a sudden attack by Grotto was taking place, as two of their finest generals had found Fralia's sacred stone and destroyed it just as quickly. This despicable act symbolized that Grotto did indeed have have an evil intent behind its actions. And so the royal siblings decided that they needed to take decisive action. Erica chose to go east to Rostin and Jahana, traveling by ship to warn them of the attacks to come. Ephraim was to go south to strike into Grotto itself, attempting to defeat the Emperor and stop their invasions from the source. It is here where the plot splits, both for our protagonist's journeys as well as the story's actual canon. For Erica, she found that no ships were willing to sail, and so traveled via mountain pass to arrive 
arrived directly in the nation of Jahana, where she found Grotta forces already there assaulting the capital. Although the Queen Ismer of Jahana was slain and the sacred stone she protected destroyed, Erika at least was able to seize the castle back, during which she ran into the forces which were sent to destroy the stone. Among these was Prince Leon himself, who spoke sadly to Erika, saying that he regretted that he was unable to prevent the invasion of Rene, implying that his father had gone mad and that Leon was helpless to stop him. Jumping back to Ephraim, he successfully fought his way south and set up his own resistance base in the western region of Grotto. As many of Grotto's generals questioned their loyalty during this time, given their emperor's sudden aggression, Ephraim's group slowly but surely was bolstered enough to fight their way right up to Emperor Vigard's location, where he seemed totally unresponsive. After defeating him right on his throne, strangely, the emperor seemed to disintegrate rather than bleed out and die, and none other than Prince Leon soon appeared before Ephraim. With a very different attitude, Grotto's prince claimed that he had always been pretending to be their friend all along, and that he had secretly resented Ephraim for years. After Leon retreated, Ephraim found a mage within the dungeons named Nal, who was better able to explain what was going on. In truth, Emperor Vigard of Grotto had died of illness over a year ago, and Leon had nearly gone mad with grief. In an attempt to resurrect his father, he had been attempting to utilize the power of Grotto's sacred stone, and during his experimentation, he had discovered a way to split it in two, forming what was called the Dark Stone. With this, he was able to bring his deceased father back to life, but at the same time, little by little, the prince seemed to change. Long ago, in the battle against the Demon King, this had been the stone which had been used to seal Formotus' soul, and without knowing it, the evil will of the Demon King had seeped into Leon, which had likely set him on his mad quest to destroy all the other stones as well. With Grotto, Fralia, and Johanna's stones destroyed, Ephraim realized that only the stones of Rene and Rostin remained. And so he quickly rushed back to his sister's side, finding her under siege at the capital of Jahana by two of Grotto's generals. Through working together, the twins were able to win the day and after stopping briefly in their homeland to retrieve their own sacred stone, which had been kept safe due to a lock that only their dual bracelets could open, they then started towards Rostin to make their final stand against their cursed former friend. Along the way, Leon suddenly reappeared before them, at last revealing the truth. If the player chose to take Erika's route, then Leon's entire soul had been devoured by the Demon King. Formotus had been acting like Leon in order to trick Erika into trusting him. If the player chose Ephraim's route, Leon reveals quite the opposite. Despite seeming like he's fully possessed, actually it was all an act. Leon had remained in control. The Demon King did have an influence on him, but for the most part he remained in control of his faculties. In either case, the siblings here are tricked, through either force or foolishness, into having their sacred stone taken away and destroyed right before their eyes. With Leon's departure again, our heroes finally arrived in Rostin, and met with the Emperor there to confer what had been going on. After defending Rostin's stone from an assault by Leon's final general, the group was able to retrieve it for themselves and travel to Darkling Woods, the site of the final battle with Formotus 800 years ago, and the place where he was about to be reborn. After facing the most powerful of their foes' monster horde, along with the defiled corpse of the great dragon Morva that Leon had recently murdered, Erika, Ephraim, and their allies discovered Leon mid ritual, and swiftly defeated him on the spot. As he was dying, whether Leon was fully possessed, or, I suppose, half-possessed, the chain of events that he had started proceeded, and quite suddenly the Demon King in his original body was reborn into the world once more. In the face of their true enemy, the twins held up their sacred stone, which immediately sealed the Demon King's soul yet again, leaving behind only his mindless raging behemoth of a body. Stealing themselves for their greatest challenge yet, the collected heroes rushed headlong into the fray, taking on each devastating blow of the Demon King while trading with their own until at last, miraculously, the evil had been defeated. With the soul of the Demon King sealed yet again, and his body nothing but dust, this enemy of humanity would never again be able to return. While our heroes mourned the loss of their friend Leon, yet at the same time treasuring each other and the friends they had made along the way, the two royals, along with the many others who had helped them restore order, settled into a new time of peace and love.
The best words to describe Fire Emblem 8's story in a very, very, very small nutshell is to say that it's just kind of painfully average. It really hurts me to sum things up so bluntly like this, because there was a lot that I enjoyed about the journeys of Erika and Ephraim. Yet at the same time, there are a lot of weird, somewhat amateurish choices here, which tended to strain the credit I was willing to give it. Let's start with a positive. Even though the Blazing Blade expanded the roster of lords you controlled from 1 to 3, when playing through the Sacred Stone, I began to realize that there was actually a lot of missed potential there. The way that the stories of Erika and Ephraim were handled was quite clearly a tribute to Fire Emblem Gaiden, in the way that Alm and Silica's tales intermingled. And now that I think about it, we didn't really get multiple narratives in the previous game when we actually could have. Once Elliewood, Hector, and Lynn came together after only a few short chapters, they pretty much stayed together until the end of the game. Although Gaiden kept the soldiers of each hero in separate camps until the end, the Game Boy Advance Age of Fire Emblem had a much much bigger emphasis on using your chosen units in whatever combination you liked, for both gameplay and story purposes. Following from this, even when our heroes split up, I also really appreciate that they did leave a way for you to still take along your early favorites. Unfortunately, this didn't mean that much to me, because up until meeting La Rochelle, it was pretty hard for me to actually care much about the rest of the cast. Of course, every player will have a different take on this, but for me, in this cast, there were just not that many strong personalities or interesting characters that left left me wanting to know more. I definitely liked some of the villains, especially Valter, Kalok, and Selina, but at the same time this is balanced out by the Demon King, probably one of the most boring and generic kind of final bosses that I've ever seen. I think the reason the playable cast doesn't stick out that much to me is because, in general, this game just imbues much less personality into them. Again, as was done in previous Fire Emblem games before the Blazing Blade, the supporting cast development is relegated to mostly mid-battle dialogue sections, and appear much less frequently in the dialogue scenes between chapters. This is paired with the absence of the pretty fun CG art that the Blazing Blade used to punch up its most emotional moments in the story. The fact that the canon changes depending on which lord's path you chose to see, despite being totally nonsensical, at least does add a very interesting wrinkle to this game's overall plot, and it also gives a good incentive to try out both paths. For my first playthrough, I went with Erika's route, which ended up being a somewhat inconsequential trek through a mountain pass to end up at Jahana. There were definitely a couple of fun scenes here. For example, I enjoyed meeting up with Saleh and the rest, but all in all, not that much actually happens. I kind of imagined that Ephraim's path would be much the same, but when you meet up with him, he just kind of casually drops that while I was having fun camping, he went and killed the evil emperor himself and stopped the entire war. When I heard this, I really couldn't believe that the split was as significant as it actually was. But at the same time, if you're not one to go back and do a second playthrough, which, let's be real, are most people, are just going to have an incomplete story on their hands. The fact that the land of Magville has never been returned to in any subsequent game, a trait exclusive to the Sacred Stones, somewhat gives me the sense that this game's characters, world, and plot have largely just been left behind. Both by many players, and to be honest, maybe even the developers themselves. Even though the characters of this game do see some representation Presentation in current series-wide projects, such as Fire Emblem Heroes or Fire Emblem Cipher. If we use the latter as an example, the characters of the Sacred Stones have only really been featured in two out of the 19 current released booster sets, which is actually the least of any main Fire Emblem game. All in all, I just get the sense that the land of Magvel and the story of the Sacred Stones simply failed to connect with players. This may not be the biggest deal, because though the Sacred Stones is rarely remembered for its plot, it does still have many features that make it stand out. As is frequently repeated, Fire Emblem 8 The Sacred Stones is known as the spiritual successor to Fire Emblem Gaiden, and although this can be seen in its story structure, it's actually in the gameplay that this is much better reflected, and that is exactly what we're going to be getting into next. <laughs> If Fire Emblem 7 was Fire Emblem 6 with improvements, then Fire Emblem 8 is Fire Emblem 7 with improvements. Due to the previous game already addressing many of the growing pains witnessed in 6, by working off that template, the Sacred Stones was able to reintroduce some of the older systems of the franchise that were left behind with the Binding Blade's focus on minimalism, with many of those systems reintroduced coming from the black sheep of the franchise, Fire Emblem Gaiden. One of the first of these reintroductions is the inclusion of trainee units, who were equivalent 
to Fire Emblem 2's villagers, Cliff, Grey, Tobin, and Atlas. In FE2, these units had little proficiency with combat at first, but if you raised them, they could eventually become extremely powerful over two promotions. On top of this, you were also able to choose what class you wanted them to promote into, something that added a great little bit of extra freedom in how you wanted to plan out your main squad. The Sacred Stones has taken this concept and ran with it, giving you not only three trainee units who work in a very similar way, but also introducing the concept of branching promotion for almost every single class in the game. For units that start with a basic class, you are able to choose from two different classes when promoting them. The charts on Serenus Forest do a great job of laying this out, and though at a glance this doesn't seem like that big of a deal, after experiencing two very different runs through this game, I found that this is actually a really big change. Just for a laugh, I tried making a 12-man squad of mounted units to crash through the game during my Ephraim run, and I found it to be not only fun, but also extremely rewarding to plan towards and execute. On top of your additional freedom and promotion, many of these new classes have brought back one of my favorite features which was last seen in FE4 and 5, with that being the addition of skills. Although no unit here starts with any skills on their own, through promotion to specific classes they are eventually able to gain one. These are more like class characteristics than the skills of old, but honestly I'll take what I can get. As an example, let's take a look at the path of a standard Wyvern Rider. When promoting, you can now choose between becoming a traditional Wyvern Lord or the new class, Wyvern Knight. Wyvern Lords are able to use swords, giving you better weapon triangle manipulation, but Wyvern Knights, despite being locked to lances forever, gives your unit the skill Pierce, which can randomly allow for your attacks to ignore defense stats. These kind of choices definitely make for very interesting trade-offs, as well as for allowing new types of gameplay into the series. In particular, I had a lot of fun playing with the new Shaman promotion type, Summoner. These units are able to create a single phantom that can move around the map like a flyer, ignoring terrain. Even though they only have a single HP, they serve as extra expendable units that have a lot of utility. They can be used as scouts, damage blockers, or even decent free damage that can soften up or kill off enemies. Even though the Sacred Stones and the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblems in general suffer from a lack of new ideas, the changes made here actually do signify some of the most creative and successful ideas ever entered into the franchise. Unfortunately, that isn't really what this game is known for nowadays in the Fire Emblem community, and I think it's about time that we finally get to the elephant in the room. Simply through its existence, the Sacred Stones sets into stone, a trend that was before just a one-off feature seen only once in the series, the use of an open world with endless optional battles. Working much the same way as it did in Gaiden, after you finish each battle, rather than being taken to the battle preparation screen for the next one, you are instead taken to a world map, where you can then visit different shops and eventually access optional skirmishes, which are repeatable battles with monsters. On top of this, at two points in the game, you are given access to what I'd call a dungeon, with the first one being very infamous nowadays as an overly easy grinding spot. Had I not approached the series in release order, the reason why being able to grind like this is so distasteful for some would not be as clear to me, so allow me to best try to express why a lot of people have a big issue with this kind of design. From the outside, Fire Emblem games look like any other JRPG. You have a host of different heroes and heroines to choose from, all super anime, and throughout the game you're able to train them, level them, and even evolve them. In the reality of these games, this is not a comparison that can go much further, because there is one feature that Fire Emblem uses that no other RPG series seems to. Limitations. In Fire Emblem, experience is a resource, and when it's out, it's out. To express this point, let's make a quick example game to clearly paint how total experience distribution in a linear style Fire Emblem game works. In our theoretical FE game, we have 25 total chapters, and in each chapter you can fight 25 enemies. For simplicity's sake, every enemy defeated will grant our heroes 25 points of experience. So that's 25 units over 25 chapters, giving 25 experience each. That means that our game's maximum amount of distributed experience eventually adds up to 15,625. Now, we need to compare that with our selection of units' potential growth. Young Lord Tingle starts with a ragtag team that eventually grows into a powerful army of 50 characters. For simplicity, each of his units start at level 10, which means that they can get 30 possible levels as is standard for Fire Emblem. If each of these remaining 30 levels costs 100 points of experience each,
each, then we have 50 units who can gain 30 levels each, which each cost 100 experience. That means in order to get everyone to maximum, we would need a total of 150,000 points of experience. The amount of experience given by our enemies in this game amounts to 10.4% of what my team would actually need for all units to hit max level. Even if we break this in half, these are still pitifully limited numbers. The distribution of experience in these games is absolutely critical, but this also goes alongside item distribution, money distribution, and so many other systems of limitation that make Fire Emblem so beloved and brilliant. When understanding this fact, it really isn't hard to see how open map systems completely destroy the experience of classic Fire Emblem. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. I suppose this is the point where I exclaim, boom, Fire Emblem 8 destroyed, and then put on my sunglasses indoors, but I'd like to stop for a minute and recognize something very, very important that a lot of veterans seem to forget about. I'm gonna get real close for this one. Some people like to play these games for different reasons. Games appeal to different people in all manner of ways. When it comes to Fire Emblem, some people just like to build the most ridiculous units they can and curb stomp the rest of the game. Some people just like to turn bad units into good units. Some people like the grinding, and some people are just not ready for the difficulty of a Fire Emblem game without grinding. There is nothing in the Sacred Stones that requires anyone to grind or utilize any of the extra open map battles. Whether you want to play the game without grinding, only grind up trainees to level 10, pick up a few support conversations before the finale, or just go deep into the endless creature campaign that follows the main story, the open worlds of Gaiden and the Sacred Stones are the best of both worlds, and I can't imagine ever having a problem with them as well as the future games I haven't played yet which also use them, as long as they continue to keep these grind features completely optional. I suppose with that out of the way, it's finally time to put everything here together and take a look at how the Sacred Stones holds up. When it came to mixing the bonkers ideas of Gaiden with the by now established standard Fire Emblem formula, the Sacred Stones is a tremendous success. At the same time, when it came to summing up my feelings on the game, the word I kept returning to time and time again was forgettable. I'm not entirely sure why I feel this way. Perhaps it's just a little bit of Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem fatigue. Looking at the Super Famicom era, the three games there all contained very different art styles and sprite work, while the three GBA games are pretty interchangeable looking. If it's not this, then maybe instead it has to do with the story and characters not really hitting the mark for me. Whatever the reason, Fire Emblem 8 was just a game that I could not find myself getting attached to. Had I not been playing it for this video series, I almost definitely wouldn't have gone back for a second playthrough. Of course, I'm glad that I did, as my Ephraim run, where I really got creative with the branching promotion system, was by far the best time that I had with the game. Which is not even mentioning how the story beats of his path were very entertaining, even if it was for the wrong reasons. I guess what I'm trying to say is that The Sacred Stones is a good game that's just a little bit too soulless for me to love. It doesn't feel like anyone's best work, more like a game that was just made to get another Fire Emblem out the door. After hearing about its development history, I think that assessment kind of makes sense. Despite the good times that I did have with it, I really don't think that FE8 is a game that will stick with me. Perhaps when this retrospective series is finally finished, maybe I'll find myself missing its world and how it mixed Gaiden and the standard mechanics together, and at that time I'll think fondly back on the many characters and their various journeys depicted here. To be honest, I kind of doubt it, but I suppose that only time can really tell. Our next stop on the Fire Emblem retrospective takes us at last into the land of Tellius, as we join the hero Ike and the struggle of the Grail mercenaries. Be sure to join me next time as this franchise takes its first steps into 3D with Fire Emblem 9 Path of Radiance. If you enjoyed this series of videos, then why not consider taking your support to the next level and becoming a Shane-brained Patreon supporter. By the way, don't just click away right now because I have some important updates coming up for the future of this series in 2020 that I think is worth hearing. 
First, I want to say that these videos take a long time to create, and while I'm trying to play the games, plan the scripts, write them, improve them, record audio, edit it, and then assemble the video, YouTube is busy burying my channel for being unable to output at the absurd speed they expect channels to be able to. Higher quality scripted videos like this don't really get along with the random whims of YouTube's algorithm. So if you want to see more videos just like it, the best way to do so is through supporting creators directly, which is why Patreon Patreon is such a good fit for me. It allows you to get a direct line to the content you love more, as well as allowing creators like myself to give even more back to you. Please take a moment to check out my Patreon page to find out how you can get extra early access to my videos, starting from a week to sometimes months in advance, for only a few dollars. My main tiers are only from $1 to $5, nothing too big. So again, if you have anything to spare, please consider helping this channel. Anyways, I promised some future updates, so let's go ahead and get to those. Throughout 2020, I will be continuing the release schedule that I used with the Thracia video to here, which means I will be making seasons of videos and then releasing them to the public after they're all finished. Since we have eight games of the Fire Emblem franchise left, I'll be doing them in two waves of four, with the first season covering Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn, Shadow Dragon, and New Mystery of the Emblem, and the second season covering Awakening, all versions of Fates, Echoes, Shadows of Valencia, and of course, Three Houses. I am definitely aiming to finish off the Fire Emblem retrospective by the end of 2020. I don't plan to take any breaks to make other similar retrospectives on any other games. I am committed to ending this absurd large project first. Anyways, this is the final video in a season of retrospectives I've been working on over the last six months, and I'd just like to give a special thank you to anyone who bothered to watch any of the last eight videos. No other project I have ever made in my history on YouTube has received as warm a reception as these, and even in the low times where I was unsure if this series could actually continue, the large groundswell of support that you have given me has continued to keep me in high spirits and inspired to keep creating. Thank you all very very, very much for watching. Until next time, everybody, this has been Shane Brained, and I hope you take care. I'd like to give a special thank you to my top patrons, Henry Gutierrez, Ignis Eisel, and Menet Rice, as well as to all my other supporters over on Patreon. Thank you all very much.